Hello and welcome to our online recording of the training translating Senate Bill 23270, Projects to Restore Natural Stream Systems. Senate Bill 23270 and this training are shaping stream restoration's future in Colorado and provide insights to inform water managers, government agency staff, watershed groups, restoration practitioners, academics, and others on how to move stream restoration projects forward under the new law. Audubon and Jackie Corday has facilitated six in-person trainings in Avon, Durango, Boulder, Alamosa, Manitou Springs, and Grand Junction. And we have also hosted numerous online virtual trainings for organizational specific needs. We've reached well over 300 strategic people. This version of the presentation that we are recording for you today incorporates a lot of great questions and feedback from around the state. And today's recording offers you the polished version incorporating this feedback from all around the state around stream restoration and the new law. Next. The goal of this training is mainly one, to identify which types of projects and restoration methods can fit within Senate Bill 270's minor stream restoration activities. And then for projects that may not be within the scope of Senate Bill 270, what are best management practices that support not only projects under the new law, but that may be beyond Senate Bill 270? Next, please. To give you a little bit of background, um, Jackie and I are co-chairs along with Faye Hartman from American Rivers of the Colorado Healthy Headwaters Working Group. And our goal is to look at uh, bringing people together um, around healthy headwaters. Our group of membership is well over 125 people and it's a diversity of academic researchers, state agencies, federal agencies, tribal membership, watershed and conservation nonprofits, and river and wetland restoration practitioners. We have the common vision of working together to increase the pace, scale, and value of process-based headwaters riverscape restoration throughout Colorado to improve watershed health, critical wildlife habitat, and ecosystem services. The Healthy Headwaters Working Group is subdivided into two committees, both the Policy and Communications Committee, as well as the Science and Projects Committee. Both of these subcommittees provide vital support um, for the effectiveness of Colorado Healthy Headwaters Working Group. Our acronym for short is HWOG, if you hear that throughout the presentation. Next slide, please. Again, Healthy Headwaters Working Group's vision is to restoring degraded riverscapes because healthy connected floodplains are better for all water users, both for people and wildlife. And these illustrations here, the slide on the left is a very familiar site across Colorado, a system, a stream system that has been degraded from potentially a variety of different land uses. And the possibilities exist to return that stream system, healing it from the degradation to the picture that you see on the right, a healthy functioning reconnected floodplain with abundant riparian vegetation, an increased diversity of um, vegetation for both livestock as well as birds and other wildlife, and a more functioning connected integrated natural stream system. Next slide, please. You can find out more about the Colorado Healthy Headwaters Working Group on our Audubon Rockies webpage. Simply Google Colorado Healthy Headwaters Working Group and Audubon, and this page will come right up. This is also the repository of where we keep our most up-to-date information for a variety of resources and references. Um, please visit this web page and download and click around uh, and find out a bit more about the Colorado Healthy Headwaters Working Group and the resources that are available here. Next slide, please. With that, Jackie, I'll turn it over to you to dive into our training today. 
Thanks, Abby. So um, just a quick background on, on myself so you understand where um, I'm coming from and, and um, how I know about this topic as well as we do. Um, as Abby mentioned, our group, the HWOG formed in 2020, but I was working on this as head of CPW's water resources section. Um, I started looking into the science of process-based restoration in particular in 2018, and what were the water rights implications. Those were the two things I was taking a deep dive on and have been involved ever since then on continuing to do research. Um, and so I am, this is our best opinion based on all of that information that we've been able to put together and all of the conversations that we have done over the past uh, five years. So this is um, our, certainly our, our opinion, but we, it's been super well received, um, including from DWR staff. So we feel like we're pretty solid on solid ground with what we're going to be showing you today. So first we're gonna start with what did the bill itself say? Was the purpose need for the bill? And um, you'll see throughout these slides that as much as possible, we are quoting directly from the bill or directly from um, the authority on particular topics that we go through as we go through here. So you can see this is in quotes, this is directly from the bill, that these are all of the things that are so important to all Coloradans, the forest and watershed health, wildfire mitigation, recovery, flood safety, water quality, recreation, riparian and aquatic habitats. These are the things that healthy rivers provide us. And therefore, because these things are so important, the state should facilitate and encourage the commencement of projects that restore the environmental health of natural stream systems. That is the purpose of the bill, is helping facilitate that um, to provide clarity on where you can do stream restoration projects and not run into conflict um, with Water Rights Administration. So the first thing to that we like to explain is it's very important to understand where will this new bill live? And it's in uh, Colorado Water Law um, Section 602, which is titled Exemptions and Presumptions. And so 602 creates exemptions to typical water rights administration for the use of water um, for certain uses because the legislature has deemed these particular uses essential and also that they are unlikely to cause material injury. Um, but there are many rules that apply to each of these uh, exemptions and they are set forth, forth in the statute. So what you're seeing in this slide is a very minor cliff notes version of what are some of these exemptions. And the, you'll see that there are a lot of ones that you're probably familiar with that you've heard about. Rural residential wells, 15 GPM or less, wells used for firefighting or monitoring, rain barrels, um, you can have two rain barrels if, if you follow all of the rules in the statute. Um, stormwater detention ponds, and there's a lot of criteria for those. Post wildland fire facilities. And now here's where the new bill lives, minor stream restoration activities. And this is where we're gonna spend the bulk of the time um, in this webinar is to explain how this fits, how you can do projects within these minor stream restoration activities. So the bill first provided what we call first level criteria. In order for your project to fit within this new law and therefore be able to get this exemption from having to get a water right, your stream, your project has to fit in the definition of a stream restoration project. So it must be within a natural stream system. And uh, the next slide will, will explain what that means. And it must be for the purposes as you that you see here in this slide. And when you read all of these purposes, it's 
pretty much covers everything that you would want to be doing a stream restoration project for. So there are key definitions to pay attention to in the new bill when interpreting the language. Um, so first off, natural stream is a definition that has been around for many decades in um, Colorado water laws. You see the citation there. It is a place on the surface of the earth where water naturally flows between observable banks. Um, although the location of such banks may vary under different conditions. But basically what you're seeing here is a definition that did not include what we like to call the entire riverscape, the whole river that included its um, floodplain and the area where it naturally moves back and forth over, over the years, over the decades. Um, that was not included in this definition. And so there's a new definition now in Colorado water law that was included in the bill, and that is natural stream system. Just adding that one word system makes all the difference here. It includes the active channel or channels, the geomorphic floodplain, and the associated riparian area. So how is that different? Why is that so important? What is the geomorphic floodplain? Well, it's if you look at this graph um, or this depiction from USGS um, and NOAA and uh, the Nature Conservancy, the three got together and did a PowerPoint on this whole topic. What is the geomorphic flood floodplain? Why is it important to be thinking about for many, many different reasons? Um, and this was one of the graphics that they produced to show how rivers naturally move over time and that that is really important for many different reasons, for flood hazard reasons, for biological reasons, for water management reasons, to, to take in account that whole area. So it is similar to the fluvial hazard zone uh, mapping that CWCB has been uh, working on for the past few years. It accounts for sediment and debris that moves through a stream corridor, while FEMA floodplain maps only account for the water in the channel. And so it is a broader way of looking at really what is a stream system. All right, so now we're gonna move into the heart of this training and that is going through the six minor stream restoration activities that were created under SB 270. And these activities can proceed without being subject to water rights administration, meaning they're exempt from having to get a water right if the project fits under one of these six categories and meets all of the criteria. So that's why we're going to spend the time going through these criteria. So the ones that are shaded in blue are the ones that we'll spend the most time on. They are the ones of most interest currently around the state because they are the, the, the categories that most get at process-based restoration, being able to actually restore the processes, the functions of, of the stream and, and the floodplain. Um, so if you see the way that you read this chart is left to right. And so we'll just quickly go through number one, um, stabilizing the banks or substrate of a natural stream. So in this case, think mostly perennial streams. Your project, whatever you've done uh, in your project, any structures you put into the stream must allow water to flow downstream during all times. So thinking of base flow as well as high flows. And your structures don't cause the water level to exceed the ordinary high water mark. And they don't in, uh, increase the surface area more than incidentally. So we will walk you through what those mean but I just wanted to give you an example of how to read this chart. And you'll notice that the language changes in column number two quite a bit um, between natural stream system and natural stream. And, and we will um, talk about the significance of this. So one of the things that we urge folks to always be thinking about the context purpose of the bill is important when interpreting the language. So going back to thinking about why was this bill passed? It was passed to help facilitate, encourage the commencement of projects to restore 
natural stream systems. So here is the very first of the six minor stream restoration activities. And you can see that there is a lot of language to unpack in that um, first category. So that's what we did on this next slide. We just started breaking it down um, into each of these elements. And then we're gonna talk about these different elements. One uh, element that we're really gonna spend a lot of time on is that fourth bullet. The structure project does not cause the water level to exceed the ordinary high water mark. Very early on after the passage of the bill, we had a lot of folks um, from our Healthy Headwaters Working Group reach out to us and say, hey, can you please help translate this new language? I am not used to working with that term. I, I have heard of that term, but that's not some um, criteria that we have been used to um, targeting our projects towards. It's like our design is not designed towards that. It's designed towards um, reconnecting the floodplain. So can you explain that for us? So we did take quite a bit of time to research that term and understand it fully within the meaning of how it uh, needs to be applied for stream restoration projects if project proponents want to fit their project within SB 270. So we started walking through the most authoritative um, publication on, on this topic. And that has been uh, for many decades, the Army Corps of Engineers has put out manuals uh, regional manuals at first around the United States because streams differ so much um, across the United States uh, by region, um, whether it's the dry southwest or the very wet um, northeast, they're different. So there was different manuals um, put out by the Army Corps to explain um, what does ordinary high water mark mean. But now um, in, 20, in November of 2022, they put out one huge manual, 400 pages long, that covers the entire United States that is solely designed to help whoever is trying to delineate ordinary high water mark. That is the purpose of this um, manual is to help you delineate ordinary high water mark wherever you are in the country. So the definition that you see in white on the screen, that has been around for decades. That has been um, the definition uh, that is the Army Corps of Engineers has used under Section 404 of the Clean Water Act to determine where is that ordinary high water mark. So that's just the basic definition that's been around. And a common description in a shorthand is that it equates ordinary high water mark to the mark left by the average peak flow over multiple years. So how does Colorado law define ordinary high water mark? Well, there is a definition um, um, under 102, section 102, and you can see it there on the screen. And if you come down to the bottom of that definition, it's basically um, what the really important language there. It's the mean annual flood or it's the ordinary high water mark, whichever is greater. That's what um, Colorado is going to go with is, is a delineation is either the mean annual flood or ordinary high water mark, whichever is greater. So then you look at the definition of mean annual flood and it's that that's where it brings in the numbers um, that is often done um, in engineering, which is, um, expected to be equaled or exceeded on the average once every 2.33 years. However, what's really important to understand is this quote from the um, Army Corps manual is that they say, despite being used as a regulatory boundary for over a century, the federal definition of ordinary high water mark does not refer to a specific frequency of high water. So there is no nothing in the manual that says 2.33 years. And that is very um, important to understand because it differs so much across the United States of what should you be looking at. In some places that 2.33 might be work really well and capture what is really happening in that stream system. 
um, to show you where it generally comes up in, uh, each year on high water as an average. But in other places, you would need quite a few more years to actually get at an average, especially in the drier streams on the west slope of Colorado. So other common terms used that may or may not equate to ordinary high water mark that you have probably heard about is bankful channel and active channel. And again, this graphic kind of shows like sometimes that can all be the same and other times it may not be. So what I found really helpful was a, um, a graphic from the new 2022 manual um, that shows extreme flows, high flows, moderate flows, and low flows. And the one that you're looking for uh, that I circled there in red is high flows. That is the one that's relevant to finding and delineating the ordinary high water mark. All of the graphics on this slide are from the manual, the November 2022 manual. So I thought these other graphics were pretty important and helpful, showing you that a braided channel uh, the high flows completely cover all of those islands and all of the braids um, and go up and uh, to and touch the floodplain there. Um, and meandering channels, also the same thing. I thought those graphics are pretty helpful. So here's another really important thing that came out of this manual. High flows sometimes include small flood flows that go over bank. For instance, stream wetland complexes is going to be a case where ordinary high water mark will not be at the active, the top of the active channel. It will be up and above that. And one of these um, examples is beaver complexes. And in some small, the narrower valleys that, um, that are in all of our headwaters in, in Colorado, you're going to often see that where the beaver complex occupies the entire valley, um, or as we refer to the riverscape, um, where that stream um, has probably historically occupied for a long time. And so this manual is now saying, okay, well, your ordinary high water mark is going to be at the valley edge. And so the manual shows it, and then this picture on the right gives you a great example of, of what does that look like. Your ordinary high water mark is basically going to be right at that green line, um, the elevation change of the, of the vegetation you can so clearly see. And here's an off-channel beaver complex in the Uncompagre National Forest. You can see the beaver pond up there in the uh, left-hand corner and the water spilling out into the main channel and some side channels, and it's occupying that whole um, valley floor or riverscape. And that's where the ordinary high water mark is going to be. So it was great to see that um, in the manual, um, but as we've been telling folks, this is generally <laughs> obviously not where you're going to be working and doing stream restoration. You're going to be working in situations like this. Um, this was a Utah um, project, but this creek is similar to many Western Colorado streams. And I used this um, because you could, um, it was such a great picture to clearly see how this particular project, even though it's not subject to obviously Colorado law, but you can see all the elements of the new Colorado law and how they are met by this particular project. So first of all, look down in the, um, the bottom of the stream and you see what are either PALs or BDAs, whatever you want to call them. You can see that they're very porous. There's no elevation change between upstream and downstream of those structures. So what that means is they are meeting the criteria of allowing base flow to completely flow through. Um, they are not uh, moving the water up and above the ordinary high water mark, which I took a guess at um, in the orange line there, um, based on the vegetation and what I'm seeing in the picture. Of course, it would be very important to have your um, practitioner, whoever you hire to do the project, be going out and documenting this. And uh, you really need to be out on the site. And I am just taking my best guess 
um, based on what I'm seeing in the picture. So those criteria of being very porous and moving through, not uh, increasing the surface area of the water um, and not moving the water above the ordinary high watermark. Those three criteria are all met in this, in this photo. And that's why I thought it was very useful. Um, what you see in the yellow line there is my attempt to show uh, probably it's a guess of where this stream used to be maybe a hundred or more years ago before it degraded and down cut. Um, and so what's really important, the next concept to understand is that this is rate from the manual too. The ordinary high water mark is not a static line and can change over both time and space. So going back to that picture, what you have to understand is that it is going to take time for those structures to do their job, but they will. They will start accumulating sediment and slowly and slowly that uh, channel uh, will start raising back up over the years. And thus your ordinary high water mark is going to adjust too over the years. And so that's why this concept is very important um, to understand. This is a concept that's been around for many decades. It's not, um, it's well adopted and understood that, that that ordinary high water mark does change. So in this these pictures, where is the ordinary or high water mark in these streams? Well, unfortunately, of course, it's, it's down there. It's down in the trench. Um, but once again, I'm taking a guess of where it used to be and where it is now. Um, and you're still able to do quite a bit of work down there to help slowly um, aggrade that stream over the years to, to reconnect back up with its former floodplain. So this degraded system likely looked like the wet meadow the beautiful picture there in the left-hand um, corner, that's probably what this stream on the right used to look like probably a hundred or more years ago. And what happens instead of it being a uh, this beautiful functioning wet meadow with a very diffuse slow flow that goes all through the meadow, it down cut um, due to some cause and this in, in this particular PowerPoint, we don't go through all of the causes. We have other <laughs> resources that talk about the causes of why did this stream down cut. Um, but the point of, of this particular slide is to show how you can work in this new law and start turning this stream back around. Um, again, that's a guess of where that ordinary high water mark is and it will change over the years as the stream slowly aggrades back up with the structures that you have put in there and hopefully the riparian plantings as well. So here's another example of a project that used post-assisted log structures and beaver mimicry structures. Um, both of those methods were used, but they all stayed below the ordinary high water mark. You can see that in, in these photos. Again, I. I say that the ordinary high water mark is not static. That comes right out of the Army Corps of Engineers manual. Here's a, a photograph from an Eagle County uh, open space project on Brush Creek using post-assisted log structures. And again, you can see that this project is meeting all of those criteria um, under the new uh, law. So here I found some more projects that are from Anna Branch Solutions in Utah. The main purpose of all of these, uh, showing you these um, projects that are not in Colorado are that if these projects were in Colorado, they would meet the new law. So this is really kind of a large woody debris um, being stacked up and maybe just anchored by a few um, posts and basically doing the same thing uh, of slowing that flow, catching that sediment and slowly aggrading the stream. You can see the line that I put in there. Uh, you can see that there's shadows underneath the roots that have been exposed as the stream down cut and degraded underneath those uh, riparian vegetation there. So you can see that this project, if it was in Colorado would fit within the new law. And I, 
show quite a few more examples of um, PALs being installed and being completely within the law. Again, these are projects not in Colorado, but just to give you more examples. And some more examples yet from Anna Branch Solutions of very loose um, PAL, um, channel spanning PALs. And you can see that they're using um, pinion pine and, and juniper. There was probably needed to do some thinning and they're using that as their materials. And again, some more uh, ones of large woody debris and um, anchored by just some a few posts. Here's a, a recent project uh, done by Trout Unlimited in Utah on a private ranch. There was complete loss of riparian vegetation due to very heavy cattle grazing over the past hundred plus years. And so um, the landowner wanted to work with Trout Unlimited to turn this back around. So they, you can see in the photograph on the left that they installed some temporary fencing just to give a rest um, to the riparian vegetation. And they did very um, low profile, very porous um, beaver mimicry or BDAs, whatever you want to call them. And again, you can see in this case that if this project was in Colorado, it would meet the new definition because you're not forcing the water above the ordinary high water mark and it's very porous and flowing through. And here is another um, approach, uh, low-tech PBR approach using sod plugs, native sod plugs just placed in the stream did this amazing transformation. You can see the before treatment and after treatment. It's just the same concept of slowing the flow, allowing the sediment to, to drop out. And you get this these amazing transformations happening and restoring it back to in the, dire in the direction to where it used to be, um, who knows how many decades ago. So there are other types of restoration methods that can also fit within SB 270. And that's what this slide is about. These are um, methods that have been around for decades that many people are familiar with, cross veins and J hooks and root wads. And um, this guidance from Steve Yoakum um, at the Forest Service is a really particularly great resource um, that goes through all the many, many different um, approaches to stream restoration. So I wanted to make sure um, folks saw that and all you have to do is Google that title and you would have access to this free manual. Okay, so we have just gone through the first category, number one. Um, and now we're gonna switch to category number three, stabilizing the banks and substrate of ephemeral or intermittent streams using deformable porous structures that may incidentally and temporarily increase surface area and infiltration. So that's the one we're now going to move through and show you projects of what does that look like. So this is what the intention was behind this particular category is getting at these channel incision problems that are happening all around our rangelands, particularly um, on the west slope of Colorado. Uh, and what you see on the left side of the picture is a beautiful, healthy uh, mesic area in rangeland that is so critical for um, wildlife, wild, uh, wildlife and livestock, birds. This is a very important area. And what you're seeing is that head cut is moving up the valley and, and destroying that meadow. And so you, you see the erosion gully. So that is what this particular um, category of SB 270 is getting at, being able to do projects that stop these erosional head cuts, stop these gullies from continuing to destroy these important mesic areas. What does that look like? Well, it really depends on how bad the erosion gully is, how deep it is will be what determines what measure you need to take. So you can see on the left, you had to take a little bit more of aggressive measure to step down the flows that will come in the spring and stop the, those flows from eroding further and cutting down that gully even further. 
Um, on the picture on the right, you can see that the erosion was just getting started, so it didn't take quite as an aggressive uh, of a measure. Um, and in one year, you will no longer be able to see those rocks. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing how fast the vegetation comes back and just covers up um, those rocks. Um, this is a project that Abby and I were um, fortunate to get to go see um, this August. And it's another example of what is called Zedic rock work to stop the head cut in an ephemeral stream. And you're looking at the picture on the left, August 2021, the project is installed. You can see what the vegetation looks like. And then two years later, how much, uh, the, you, you can't even see the rocks anymore. The forage is much uh, healthier and diverse for the livestock and wildlife, much better situation all the way around. So going back to that meadow that I showed you a few slides before. So you can see that there's no stream channel on the right. And, and that's because it's just completely diffuse flows all through the wet meadow. But unfortunately, um, near the buildings way out in, in the background of the picture, it looks like this picture on the left. It is now down cut and a channel has formed. That is not a natural stream as far as that wasn't there before, it was all diffuse. And so this is not even really an intermittent stream. This is still an ephemeral stream. It's just now an erosion bully. And so how do you treat that? Well, simple little um, structures we're able to be able to put in. You see there on the upper uh, top right-hand side, very simple porous structures. Um, to try to address that erosion gully. And in just two years, you see the picture on the bottom, that is how much a difference it is, it is made to healing that, that gully. And here's another intermittent stream. Um, it's a floodplain that formed long ago. It's a new, it's a whole new floodplain. It probably formed back a uh, hundred years ago. And um, it has been treated with PALS and wood accumulation is occurring. So where you see that clump of wood in the center um, that was just a simple uh, amount of uh, posts that were put in there. And now you see uh, during the spring runoff, there was accumulation behind it and the moisture was uh, retained in that intermittent stream much longer than it would have been otherwise. Um, so it's slowly rewetting that area and will connect back up to that floodplain over a matter of years. Okay, now we're gonna move on to a third category, category number six that you see down there, installing structures or reconstructing a channel in a natural stream system. So again, that's the whole geomorphic floodplain after recovering from the impacts of a uh, wildfire or flood emergency. So the purpose of the project is to do the recovery work after a fire or flood emergency. So what's really important, again, I underlined those words, it's a, a natural stream system and it's in an emergency. So let's walk through that. This provision provides huge opportunities to do low tech process-based work post-fire and flooding. Natural stream system, again, is key. There are no constraints of ordinary high water mark or incidental increase in surface area. Those are not constraints under this particular one because there's already been so much information provided um, to the state and the legislators and our state leaders about how damaging these fires have been, um, especially uh, the Cameron Peak fire. Um, there's the 416, the East Troublesome, uh, the Hayden. There's so many fires that have happened that have greatly impacted our um, drinking water sources. And um, agencies that have managed these water resources had, had to shut down their intake valves time after time and incurred huge costs because of the massive ash debris flows that happen after these fires. Therefore, the legislature deemed that this work is really important to move forward to stop those debris flows 
um, after these fires have happened. So the emergency is not defined, but again, there's lots of examples in Colorado that substantial wildfire impacts to water supplies last for five or more years, unfortunately. So what does the work look like to stop these massive debris flows? Again, what's really been effective is these low tech process based restoration um, approaches of basically putting wood in the stream to stop that debris flow, to filter it out. So this is a project that's done um, by Wildlands Restoration Volunteers and the Cameron Peak Burn Fire area. And also the Coalition for the Puda River has been doing the same work. Um, and the methods, I took this right from their website that they are using is creating log jams, felling trees into the stream and the floodplain to provide that roughness um, to stop those debris flows. Zedic rock structures, as we've already seen what those are, and willow riparian um, staking, and then post-assisted log structures. All of these methods can fit within this particular minor stream restoration activity that we're talking about right now. So what about taking actions before the fire happens that can lessen these damaging um, post-fire debris flows? We know through science that that's really critical to get out there and do work before the fire. Um, certainly a lot better uh, situation to work before than after. Um, so I just wanted to mention there is a very important program that CD CWCB has put together over these past couple of years, a Wildfire Ready Watersheds Program. Um, and the main goal is to assist communities in planning and implementing mitigation strategies to minimize these fire impacts before the fire happens. And there's grants available um, to develop action plans, wildfire ready uh, watershed action plans. So reach out to Chris Sturm if this sounds something of interest to you and there's the website there that provides all the information. But what about also improving drought resilience before a fire happens? Um, there's a lot of great studies on showing how having, going from a dry parian situation there on the top left to natural storage and slow seep is a much better situation for drought. You can think of it as almost being as important as the first snowpack. We know how critical the first snowpack is. The second snowpack is also, the science is showing that that is also very critical to be thinking about. So how can you do this work before if you're not working in this, the emergency situation? Okay, it goes back to those two categories that we've already gone through. Um, and so I show this picture again, because it's really interesting. If you take away the burned trees in this photograph and you replace them with live trees. So you're not working in a post-fire, you're working pre-fire. You can see that project completely fits within category number one. Um, you are still allowing the water to flow downstream. You didn't uh, make it go over the ordinary high water mark, and there's only incidental increase in surface area. So that project would have fit, fit within SB 270 whether or not there was a fire. And so does um, category number three. All right, we are going to take just a little bit of time to start walking through some of the other um, categories that are not necessarily low tech PBR, but more like high tech process based restoration. And so this first one is mechanical grading of a ground surface along a natural stream system. Again, think of the whole geomorphic floodplain in a manner that does not result in groundwater exposure, which has always been Colorado law, that you cannot expose groundwater without having to get an augmentation plan. You can't divert water, um, surface water, or you can't collect it. So as long as you, those are, think of those as your three big criteria. So the key word again, natural stream system, and then there's many possibilities, approaches under this. Levy setbacks was the first thing that came to mind where you, you, you need the big equipment to come in and take out a, a levy that perhaps was put in 50, 60, 70 years ago. And um, if 
if you want to be able to reset that back to reclaim some of the floodplain and all of the benefits of being able to have a wider floodplain. So in this picture, you can see that where the existing levee is, is really close. It's really channelized that river and they're going to set it back. Um, it looks like maybe, who knows if that's about a hundred or more feet. They have constraints. They have a ballpark of a, a, a field there. So they need to have that levy back again, um, but they're gonna get the benefit of, of, of the river having access again to its former floodplain. You can do that without, um, by meeting these criteria, by not exposing groundwater, not diverting the surface water out of that geomorphic floodplain and not collecting, doing the grading in a way that you're not collecting stormwater. Here's another project. Um, that uh, recently there was a great article about this levee setback uh, project in Washington, where it used to be completely channelized. You can see in the picture on the right how the stream was completely channelized by a, a levee that was causing a lot of flooding problems downstream of those levees, because it was forcing the water like a fire hose into this one channel. And so they decided to, based on a lot of scientific studies that have been showing all the benefits of bringing back those levees and, and, and recapturing some of that floodplain use again, you can see where they set the, the levee back way back further. And now that whole side channel is able to function and they've documented all of the benefits of being able to do that. Um, and so there's a, a website if you're interested there that I put down below um, on reading about that really great project. So that uh, is something that's really well explained in this project. Uh, this idea about floodplain recovery potential will depend upon many factors, including existing land uses. So we think of it as recovery area. What is your recovery potential? And that's going to vary every single time on where you're working. If you're working down in the more semi-urban uh, uh, areas, then your floodplain recovery potential is going to be quite a bit less. If you're working way up in the, the headwater areas, then it's going to be quite a bit more. And so here's a couple of more projects from Stillwater Sciences showing projects that they've been able to do that basically allowed the river to have greater access to its floodplain that it used to have access to um, and all of the benefits from that. And you can see in the bottom project, taking out that levee and allowing the river to reconnect back to its former floodplain would fit within this new category. All right, another category is daylighting a natural stream that has been piped or buried. Um, when you Google that term, you try to find examples of projects. Um, there's not a lot yet out there, but I did find these two, uh, one from uh, Yonkers, New York, that picture that you're looking at on the left, that stream was completely buried under concrete and asphalt, and they daylighted it, uh, it which reaped so many benefits for um, the whole community around it. Um, and then this one from um, Auckland, New Zealand. But here's an example of what daylighting can look like in Colorado. Um, this is a slide from DNR. We asked if we could borrow it when we saw it because we thought, wow, this is really awesome. Here's Colorado daylighting. Um, you see on the left, a stream that was uh, the Swan River near Breckenridge was completely buried um, underneath tons and tons of mining debris. And now you see on the right how it was daylighted. And a uh, cool story is the uh, Abby, if you want to jump in and tell the story of where the bill was signed on this slide. Thanks, Jackie. Absolutely. Um, Senate Bill 23270 was signed by Governor Polis and leadership uh, around this bill at the Swan River Restoration Site. It was um, really touching to watch the governor understand the complexities of what happened um, on this location as far as the mine tailings. Um, from a completely disappeared channel to a an open water now channel. Um, Director Dan Gibbs was also on site and providing some of the interpretation uh, for the phases of the Swan River restoration site with additional phases planned coming soon. 
Um, but it was a really remarkable um, event that really brought the letter of the law to life um, by visiting and signing uh, this stream restoration bill here at the Swan River Restoration Site. Thank you, Jackie. Yeah, I think uh, it was a really great story and you were there, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we've gotten through all the categories. Now we're gonna go into some of the legal language. Quoted right from the bill. If a stream restoration project is limited to one or more minor stream restoration activities, then the stream restoration project does not cause material injury to any vested water right. So that is the main reason why you don't have to go and get a water, um, an augmentation plan or a water right for your project if it fits within 270 because the bill is declaring, the law is declaring that you do not cause material injury. And you also, um, your project is not an unnecessary dam or other obstruction, which is another area uh, area of jurisdiction that DWR has over potentially your project if your project is causing uh, obstruction to the flow to water rights downstream. So that's why the criteria are as um, how they were thoughtfully laid out as they were is to very um, substantially reduce the risk of any harm to water rights. And, and that is very important is we have been giving our trainings um, throughout the years on this topic we have always explained why it's so important to make sure you are doing your projects and not impacting water rights and respecting water rights. And that's what this language is, is getting at. Um, there's also a grandfather clause, a stream restoration project that has obtained any applicable permits or is under construction or has been completed by August 1st, 2023, does not cause material injury to any vested water right or is not an obstruction. So it's basically giving breathing space to those projects um, that were already in the pipe um, before this law came through and basically saying, um, you do not cause harm to water rights if you meet one of these criteria. Um, there's also safeguards, as we call, or sideboards for water users and the compacts. So it's very important that an owner uh, or a proponent of stream restoration project does not install the project in a manner that adversely affects the function of structures used to divert water or measure water flows. Um, again, that's something that we have in our um, trainings that we've been doing is to make sure you're not impacting um, water rights and, and the functions of, of water infrastructure. Also, nothing in the statute prohibits the state engineer from taking any action necessary to comply with an interstate compact, interstate apportionment decree, or interstate agreement. What is also important to understand, we had many questions from uh, folks who did not understand if the new law required um, them to go and get every project reviewed by DWR prior to commencing their project. So we include this slide to explain that, that the state law does not require stream restoration projects to be reviewed by DWR. Again, this is uh, being uh, taking information directly from DWR's Pond Management and Restoration Projects webpage and copying that language right from the web page. So that said, um, it is up to project proponents to decide if they want DWR review prior to commencing a project. We've talked to many folks who do do that as a matter of, of practice. And then what we found out when DWR staff that attended our trainings um, and they talked about it, about this, they stated they would appreciate being contacted early in the process so that they can give input and identify issues. And they gave a lot of examples of why um, it, it would be beneficial to all of the project partners um, to come to them early so that they could identify issues um, and the project can move forward um, with any concerns being addressed. After listening and, 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 and having that interaction with DWR staff, we definitely agree with them that that is just a good practice. 
Um, so again, it is up to project proponents um, to make that decision, but we are encouraging that interaction with DWR. So this is another question that has come up over and over from folks. What about beaver? Um, so SB 270 addresses human made restoration structures and projects. It does not address natural beaver dams. Beavers and their dams are a natural condition of streams and CPW has management authority over wildlife. Those are just three key bullets that I wanted to put out there. I know it doesn't address every question, but this could take itself another webinar on this topic. Okay, before we jump into part three, we're gonna take a one minute intermission and be right back. All right, now we're gonna talk about projects that may not fit within SB 270. So there was some really important language um, in the bill, now in law, that states nothing um, in this subsection or basically the new bill creates a presumption of injury for any activity that does not meet the definition of a minor stream restoration activity. So saying that another way, what's really important to understand is that just because your project does not fit with an SB 270 does not mean that it's automatically presumed to cause injury. And so there are lots of ways that you can continue to work outside of 270, but be very careful um, about all of the planning considerations and where you're working and how you're working. And so that's what we're gonna talk about. So here's an example of a project that may not fit under the stream restoration activity. And that is because when you look at these pictures, um, this was a project with beaver mimicry structures, very porous, but because the incision was only about two feet, the disconnection from the floodplain just about two feet, they very quickly brought the water up. So the question is, was that over the ordinary high water mark? Well, at first, when you look at this picture, you may think that the ordinary high water mark is somewhere right about here. And that's what I originally, when I looked at this picture and thought maybe um, it was right about here. And so therefore this may not fit. However, um, Abby um, and I were able to go and take a look at this project again. I had been out on this project um, uh, several times over the past few years. And we were able to go out there again now with this new knowledge of the new um, manual, the Army Corps of Engineers manual, and really take a, a harder look at that and have a conversation with the folks that have been out there, the practitioners and the Forest Service folks um, and other partners that have been out there on the land and watching the river and the flows. And what we realized is that it's not that easy. <laughs> it's not that easy actually to delineate the ordinary high water mark in this particular situation. But after walking the land and seeing all the, the side channels that go up and talking to the folks that have been out there and seeing the water very uh, often being up here in the high spring flows, then we realized that, well, this delineation is not going to be as easy as just looking at a picture for sure. You definitely need to be looking at clues on the land of where it is. Um, all right, so this is where we also spend some time. <laughs> And this is on planning considerations to reduce risk of potential water rights concerns and other potential conflicts. Now, these guidelines uh, were drafted um, by myself and many other partners that came together that I spoke to, um, not only in Colorado, but all across Western states on lessons learned. Um, because it's not just Colorado where there's issues of water rights concerns, it's certainly um, all of the other um, drier states in the West, that those conversations have come up too. So having a lot of conversation with folks across the West, what are some key lessons learned on how you can reduce the risk of having conflicts with water rights? What are those? 
that's where this list came from. This list was drafted before SB 270 ever came into play. This list was started to be drafted back in 2021. And we built upon it based on many more conversations since 2021. So the first um, thing in the list you see there is the historic footprint. Design your project to stay within it. I'm gonna jump ahead to one slide to talk about what does that mean. I think a lot of folks on the call will probably be somewhat familiar with historic footprint, um, but maybe uh, some folks not. So essentially what the historic footprint was or is, <laughs> is where was that stream and its associated riparian, associated riverine wetlands potentially, where was that riverscape before the degradation occurred and the stream down cut and incised? And then you started getting that transformation from uh, a healthy um, riparian corridor to a degraded one where the riparian can no longer survive, the water table is dropped. Now it's transitioning to sagebrush and potentilla. So you look at these photographs, this photograph here, and you can see on one side of the highway to the left, a stream, a very uh, sinuous stream um, snaking its way through a riparian corridor with lots of riparian vegetation. Then you see, you come to the highway and you cross it, and now it's a different landowner and you see all of that vegetation gone and the stream is much more straightened and channelized. However, in the picture, you can see the evidence of where it used to be. You can see that side channel going up here and here. You can see it all, all through here. And you know that the vegetation used to look like just right across the street. <laughs> so what you're seeing in this photograph is two different types of evidence of where that historic footprint used to be. The aerial photo itself, and then you're also seeing what we call a reference reach of similar streams, valleys, wetlands, proof that this used to look like this. When you don't have aerial photos um, or really close nearby reference reaches, oftentimes you can do geological testing and soil profiles to see where the riverscape used, used to be. Also the Colorado Natural Heritage Program's historical wetland area mapping tools are very helpful in their watershed planning toolbox. So these are all things that you could Google and find. These are all free tools. There's many, many more tools in this. These are, are just some top examples. So why is it important to stay in the historic footprint? Because you're not going to be having any more additional evapotranspiration occur post project than what it used to be. So all of this red, riparian vegetation, if it was able to get restored here, is basically just going to be the same amount of ET that was there before then um, um, when the degradation occurred and took it away. So that's why you're just turning the clock back to what it was before. The same amount of water use, the same amount of evapotranspiration is occurring um, after you, you um, restore it than what was there historically. Oops, I'm gonna go back to this list. So again, we, we, we tell folks to choose these factors with care, your location, look for opportunities in places that minimize risk of conflicts with water rights and flooding potentially from beaver. If your beaver come back, you wanna think about upper watersheds above reservoirs and diversions, um, having partners um, that include the, the senior water rights um, holder. So either whether you're on public land or private land, thinking about that. Um, the design, we've talked about and shown you many, many designs that are very porous and allow the water to move through, and yet they still do the work of slowly aggrading um, the, and catching that sediment, aggrading the stream, reconnecting to its floodplain. The timing of your installation, you need to be careful and be thinking about low flow summer months. You don't want your project to reduce flows downstream or your project for any significant time. These two bullets in particular came from examples of projects that I had heard of that did impact water rights because they built their, their BDAs too aggressively tight 
and the flows didn't go through and they did it in the summer months and that caused problems for downstream water rights holders. So again, these best management practices are coming from actual true cases of where you want to avoid that. Um, this other one is something that we uh, talk about a lot, engagement, transparency, many partners, who would potentially be concerned, include them, or at least address their concerns. Project planning that proactively includes water users and other watershed stakeholders who would potentially be concerned has many benefits. And we also added recently these post-project considerations. Adaptive management is very important in especially in low-tech PBR, what worked, what didn't, um, opportunities to apply lessons learned after the project, monitoring for changes is another important thing that um, our research and our conversations have shown, looking at the, the hydrology, the flows, the surface area, the vegetation, sediment capture, um, plant and animal species diversity, telling the story of your project. Um, and being able to document that it is important. And then assisting landowners um, with beaver coexistent issues if they come up after the project um, is also a very important consideration. So here's a picture I show to talk about BDA designs. You can see on the left, it's a very aggressive design, very tight, and you can see a huge elevation difference between um, the stream um, before the BDA and after it, that is alone is enough to cause concerns about water rights, the perception alone there. I do not know, in fact, if it did cause problems. I'm just saying that perception is, is important to pay attention to as well. And that could cause you problems, uh, that kind of design versus the design on the right, which I hold up as a model. <laughs> Of, of how to be thinking about designing your, your BDAs. So this last section, just a couple more slides now. Um, as we've, Abby and I have gone around the state, each time we try to tailor uh, this last section to the particular basin that we're in. The last basin that we were in was in uh, Grand Junction. And so you can see the middle Colorado watershed plan and some other plans in that area um, all being shown. And then we just talk about generally what are some potential next steps for your watershed now that you think you're thinking about this and seeing all of the capabilities under SB 270 of how you can do this work. How is that going to change, change your perceptions of what is capable in your watershed is kind of this is the part of the conversation we just want to generate. And we've had really great discussions around the state about this. Um, and this is one slide that's pretty universal. Again, we're circling back to, to this particular CWCB program because it's such a great opportunity. And yet there is a deadline on these funds. Um, the funds must be contracted by December 30th, 2024, and spent before December 30th, 2026. So there's still a great opportunity for next year of getting under contract and still having two more years to do the work. And so that's why we always try to end with this particular slide. All right, at this point, we are all wrapped up. And I hope that if you have questions after listening to this um, training that you will reach out to Abby or I um, and you will visit that website. Um, all of our um, emails are available from the three co-chairs of the Colorado Healthy Ed Waters Working Group. Myself, Abby Burke, and Faye Hartman are all listed on the website. I hope you feel comfortable and can reach out to us. We welcome your questions. Abby, do you have anything else more, more to wrap up with? <laughs> Thank you, Jackie, and thank you for all who have reviewed this recording. It is invaluable information that really does steer how stream restoration and water rights work with respect to each other and within this new law. 
And we just really appreciate your attention, your thoughtfulness in your projects and how important it is to bring people together for the strength and the durability and the future of your stream restoration projects. So thank you again for viewing this recording. Please don't hesitate to reach out. Visit the Colorado Healthy Headwaters Working Group page and we'll be in touch. Um, and thank you again for your attention. Have a great rest of your day.